Welcome everyone to the third Axworthy Distinguished Lecture Series on Social Justice and the Public Good. Uh, my name is Dr. Paul Laurie. I'm an associate, or er, I'm actually able to say that in July, technically. Uh, I'm in limbo between an assistant and now recently tenured associate professor in the Department of History. Thank you. <laughs> Where, I, <laughs> Where I teach and write on issues of race, labor, and the city in modern America. Uh, so this lecture, uh, particularly today by uh, Mayor Nenshi, has particular uh, relevance to someone like myself. Um, I just want to acknowledge some special guests before we begin. Uh, President and Vice Chancellor Dr. Annette Trimby. Eric Johnston, yes. <laughs> Eric Johnston, Chair of the Board of Regents. And Albina Moran, Vice Chair of the Board of Regents along with friends of the Dr. Axworthy Lecture Series, including Albert El Tassi, President and CEO of Peerless Garments, who has made a generous donation to making this evening's lecture possible. So thank you very much. I just want to acknowledge that we are on Treaty 1 territory in the heart of the Métis Nation, and I think that these words are especially relevant to today's lecture, the spirit of the Axworthy Lecture Series in this year's Spring Institute, the secular, the religious, and the public, in that they remind us of the contested linkages between space, place, and identity. I think by acknowledging our presence on Treaty One land, it reminds us, all of us, that all space, whether public or private, is never neutral, but are products of various social, economic, and political forces which shape those and are shaped by all those who come to reside in them. And it's in our attempts to negotiate and reconcile these contending forces of learning to live together, to learn and live with our differences, whether at the local or the global level, that issues of social justice and equality, of which this lecture series is named after, come to the fore. And we here at the University of Winnipeg, situated in the heart of a diverse, yet often divided urban environment, confront these issues on a visceral, everyday basis. It's something we confront the minute we walk out the doors of our institution. Social justice and the public good are not just platitudes or buzzwords at the University of Winnipeg. They are the past, present, and future imperatives of our university community. These imperatives have been reflected in our previous speakers in this lecture series, whether our first speaker, Dr. Cornell West, who taught us about the importance of creating a beloved community and modeled that in his scholarship and also his unyielding propensity to give hugs, hugs to everybody. We won't hold you to that, Mayor Nenshi. Dr. Jane Goodall, who spoke of the public good in relation to the natural world, and today the first Canadian speaker in this series, Mayor Nenshi, Mayor of Calgary, who will speak to taking care of one another and the urban dimensions of the public good. So the vision of this program is to provide Winnipeggers access to world-class lectures free of charge and provide a platform for this vital and ongoing discussion on social justice, on the public good, both at home and abroad. This is truly part of an ongoing discussion. It's an imperfect process, but one which we continue to strive towards. I want to note that this program is funded by donation. We thank those in attendance, all those in attendance who have donated. This lecture is also part of a university course uh, call, called the Center for the Liberal Arts and Secular Society, or CLASS, Spring Institute, the Secular, the Religious, and the Public, with instructor uh, Dr. Ray Silvas, and we welcome the CLASS students and professors here this evening. Uh, tonight's lecture will consist of a, following uh, the lecture, I should say, will consist of a short question and answer period with pre-selected questions from those same students from the Spring Institute. Just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, the washrooms are located on the second floor of Duckworth. Uh, there is no flash photography. It's prohibited. And in the interest of the public good, please turn off your cell phones. So now I invite Dr. Annette Trimby, President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Winnipeg, to the front for some opening remarks. Good evening, 
Mayor, before you got in here, Dr. Paul Lowry shared with us that he had recently been promoted. So I'd like to start by congratulating him on that step. I too am going to acknowledge that I am welcoming you to the University of Winnipeg, which is located on Treaty 1 land in the heart of the Métis homeland. Tonight will be really special. We get to hear from a very special Canadian. I was living in Alberta at the time Mayor Nenshi was elected, and is it fair to say you caught a few people by surprise? You were probably one of the first people who figured out how to really use social media in a political way. I was also there for the 2013 flood. And I know Winnipeggers have experienced floods. So you can imagine what was happening in Calgary and in High River in 2013. Mayor Nenshi was phenomenal. I watched him do things that most mayors wouldn't do. The way things were handled in that flood were very different than any other past floods. The mayor was very, very transparent, and he worried less about risk, I think, than some other mayors might have. And one of the big things that he is known for is he allowed people to go into their homes uh, before they were inspected. And as you can imagine, in Fort McMurray today, um, a lot of people are being told that their homes didn't burn, but their homes are not livable in. Right, so you can imagine just how, how tragic that is for people. So we're very proud to host the Axworthy series. Dr. Axworthy might come in at the tail end of your lecture. He's on an airplane. Surprise, surprise. He's still uh, very out there. So we're very proud to have the Axworthy series, and you're the third. And the first fellow gave a lot of hugs, and Jane had some stories about her childhood, so I know you'll have some some thread that uh, fits in well with everybody. So why do we do this? Why do we have lectures like this on campus? Why do we have events where we have faculty, students, staff, keynote speakers, and community? We do it because we want to be a place of dialogue, a place where we have interesting, sometimes challenging conversations. Because what do we think our job here is at the University of Winnipeg? We think our role is to grow tomorrow's leaders. And you can't lead if you can't think, if you can't be critical about what is going on in the world. You can't lead if you can't imagine coming up with solutions. There are lots of wicked problems that we deal with on a daily basis. So with that, I just want to welcome Mayor Nenshi. But before, Sharon powell Rupri, another one of our new professors, who's a good friend of the mayor, and I, I have to say, kind of a Calgary friend of mine as well, we can compare transitions returning, both returning back to Winnipeg where we grew up. So Sharon Paul, am I mi mixing up and doing your job? Okay, all right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Trimby. Uh, just a few quick items to mention. Uh, Donations are being received tonight by the University of Winnipeg Foundation. Uh, all money raised will go towards future lectures and, and enable the university to continue to provide these events to all of you at no cost. Uh, so please consider supporting this valuable work and making a donation on your way out of the lecture tonight. Uh, in terms of access, this event is being recorded by the University of Winnipeg and it will be broadcast on the Axworthy Lecture Series YouTube channel and available on the class website. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Sharon Paul Rupri, writer and assistant professor of women's and gender studies here at the University of Winnipeg, who will introduce our featured guest. Hello. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce His Worship, Mayor Nahid Nenshi, Calgary's 36th mayor. I'm one of those people uh, who is fortunate enough to say that I knew him before all this worship business. We met in Calgary uh, during Asian Heritage Month over 11 years ago, and to be honest, he was really shy. Yes, really shy. Uh, but he had this vibrant energy around him. His passion for the arts was well established. Uh, he was the board chair for the Epcor Center for the Performing Arts. Um, which is now called Arts Commons. 
uh, he wanted to be invited uh, or rather included in everything, uh, all the events that month, and he wanted to meet everybody. I grew to know him and his love for the city through these events, and this is where Nahid shines. He encourages people, everyday citizens, uh, to get involved in their city through projects like Three Things for Calgary, serving on boards and city councils, uh, establishing Neighborhood Day. He mentors people through his leadership to build better communities and transport, transform government. As Annette, uh, Dr. Trimby said, his presence on social media and how he holds office is a model of transparency, accountability, and approachability. It's no wonder uh, that he was awarded the World Mayor Prize in 2014. Yes, quite an accomplishment. Now, you would think that some of these accolades would have gone to his head. And people always ask, is he really that nice? And I'm here to tell you that yes, he is. Being at dinner parties or at uh, parties with him, people go right up to him and ask for photos, for selfies, and he almost always agrees, which may be why we're late today. <laughs> I'm sure by now everybody in Calgary has a selfie with him. Don't worry, you'll get your chance. Uh, some of these selfies have been uh, taken at the Calgary Folk Festival, where he's a regular and he stands in line to put down his own tarp. I will, this is kind of a folk fest crowd, I think. Um, seeing this man skip across the lawn uh, with tarp in hand always brings me great joy, simply because if he skips, that means I don't have to. Um, and yes, if you're wondering, uh, I have been trying to lure him to the Winnipeg Folk Festival, but it coincides with uh, the Calgary Stampede. Uh, oh, no, no, the Stampede, so much fun. Um, and his annual horse ride on Garfield. And we wouldn't want Garfield, we wouldn't want to let Garfield down. His passion for the cities and the arts is contagious. He has been known to pen a poem or two. Recently, he threw down the gauntlet to other mayors <clears throat> across Canada to embrace National Poetry Month. He has the gift of gab that sometimes gets him to hot water. But I think that's one of his strengths. He asks of everyone, including himself, to rise to the occasion on issues that are political minefields, whether it's his leadership around the Syrian refugee crisis or pitching in and helping out with flood cleanup and now fire cleanup, um, or issues such as wearing religious symbols in citizenship ceremonies. Mayor Nenshi is a social justice advocate, reaching out and giving voice to those in need. He truly embodies the type of leadership that we need in our cities today. Nahid grew up in Calgary, and he holds a Bachelor of Commerce degree with distinction from the University of Calgary, and a Master in Public Policy from the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University, where he studied as a Kennedy Fellow. About the only thing that I can hold over my dear friend is that I hold a PhD, and he does not. not <laughs> I am too. He doesn't hold a PhD, not yet anyway. I'm honored and I'm honored to present the best of YYC to Peg City and introduce Mayor Nahid Nenshi. I promise you're all in there. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Sharon Paul, excuse me. Thank you, Dr. Ruprai. I love saying that. She may hold a PhD, but only one of us has tenure as a professor, just saying. <laughs> yet, yet, yet. Uh, I should correct one thing she said. It wasn't that I was shy uh, when I met her, it's that I was terrified of her. Bonjour tout le monde, c'est vraiment un grand honneur pour moi d'être ici avec vous ce soir. Vraiment, c'est un peu étoyant pour moi, je suis surpris d'être devant vous. Comme on voit les autres parleurs dans cette série, 
mon ancien professeur Cornel West, la vraie héroïne du monde, Jane Goodall, et moi. Like on Sesame Street, une de ces choses n'est pas comme des autres. And it is particularly exciting <clears throat> for a relatively undistinguished academic, uh, such as myself, to be giving uh, this wonderful distinguished lecture. And let me just say thank you to the University of Winnipeg, to Dr. Trimby and her team, thank you to the organizers tonight, uh, and thank you to the volunteers for making all of this possible. It really means a lot to me that you were welcoming me in this way. Thank you all. Oki nitsukwa. Nitsu wanok a besto tipist. Get ganasti mat nitsipwa. Now, for those of you who don't speak Blackfoot, or more to the point, for those who do speak Blackfoot and have no idea what I was just attempting to say, <clears throat> it's a very hard language. I speak four. This is the hardest one. Greetings to all my relations. I'm the one they call the clan leader. He who moves camp and the others follow, and I welcome you all. It is a great honor for me to stand here today on Treaty One land in the historical homeland of the Métis Nation. And I bring you greetings from the place I come from. I come from a place called Mokinstis, the elbow. It's a place where for thousands of years, people have met at the banks of two great rivers at the confluence of those rivers, where they have lived and loved and hunted and fished and traded, where they've had great victories and where they've tasted bitter disappointment, where they've told stories and where above all they built community. I love that common indigenous greeting, greetings to all my relations, because it talks about how we are indeed intertwined as a community. The original inhabitants of my land were called the Nitsitapi. We call them the Blackfoot now. And over millennia, they were joined by people of many other nations. From the north, the Beaver people, the Sutina people. From the east, the Stony people, the Nakoda people. And over the millennia, people from every corner of the earth. And in 1877, a few years before Calgary became a town, at a place just east of Calgary called Blackfoot Crossing, people of different nations came together and they made treaty. That document, Treaty Number 7, talks about how we welcome newcomers. It talks about how we share this land. And for me, it is extremely important for us to remember that we are all, every one of us who share this land, treaty people. The late Michael Green and the late Narcissus Blood taught me that lesson, and it's a lesson that I do not forget. Of course, today, many of our thoughts are with the people of Treaty 8, northeast of Treaty 7, particularly the Athabasca Tribal Council people, the people of Fort Mackay, of Fort Chippewan, of Fort McMurray, and of the regional municipality of Wood Buffalo. There are people in our community who need our help right now. And we are very proud and very honored to offer that assistance. I'm going to speak a little bit more about Fort McMurray and the wildfires in a bit, but I will tell you that while it is my pride and my honor and the pride and honor of my community to look after our neighbors from the north, I am in fact a lousy host because I want my guests to go home. And I want them to go home as soon as possible, um, as soon as it is safe for them to be able to do so. When we think about those treaties. We sometimes think of them as a deal between the Crown and Indigenous people, but I would argue that indeed they are about all of us, because there are a series of promises that were made. They act as a framework for how we treat one another, or I should say how we should treat one another. And I would argue to you that every time that we build community, in our own communities, we are, in fact, honoring treaty. I'm not foolish enough to say that this nation has always honored treaty. Promises have been broken. The consequences have been tremendous. I'm going to paint a very rosy picture of Canada, because that's the Canada that I believe in. 
the Canada that I think that we should all strive towards. But I do want to point out that this is also the Canada of the Komagata Maru. It's the Canada of the Chinese head tax. And it is, of course, the Canada that invented and sustained residential schools. It's a Canada where far too many of our Indigenous sisters are murdered and missing in a community that for too long didn't seem to care. But it's also the Canada of Marie Sinclair. It's the Canada of truth and reconciliation. It's the Canada where in this time of reconciliation, we continue to strive to figure out how we build a shared path of prosperity together. And I think that shared prosperity starts with a very, very, very simple question. It's the question that I call the most Canadian of questions. And that question is, how can I help? It's a question that comes naturally to Canadians at time of disaster. It's a question that comes naturally to Canadians usually when there's not a time of disaster. But lately, sometimes, too often, that question is paired with another important sentiment. And that sentiment is, we should be looking after our own. Usually that's interpreted to mean, look only after those who look like me, or act like me, or with whom I can identify. But I actually love the statement, we should look after our own. I think we should look after our own. You can tell I'm being a bit subversive. Because of course our own means all the people with whom we share a common humanity. And looking after our own, looking after our own to make sure each of those human beings can live a life of dignity is one of the core elements of what it means to be human. Tonight, I want to spend some time with you thinking about this question from a slightly different lens. And that lens is thinking about resilience. Thinking about resilient people and thinking about resilient communities. And for the rest of our time together, I want to explore the concept of resilience and how it plays through with our people and our communities. Just last week, I was very, very proud that Calgary was named by the Rockefeller Foundation as one of the world's 100 resilient cities. We were named with Toronto and Vancouver. Montreal was already on the list, so four of the world's 100 resilient cities are Canadian cities, something about which I'm very proud. The Rockefeller Foundation defines resilience as, well, they talk about urban resilience. Urban resilience is the capacity of individuals, communities, institutions, and businesses within a city to survive, adapt, and grow, no matter what kind of chronic stresses and acute shocks they experience. Thinking about this has helped me think more broadly about this concept of resilience. How do we build communities that are truly resilient financially, environmentally, and socially? How do we help people within our communities build resilience of their own? Because I believe that when we are resilient, Canada works better than anywhere in the world. So I'll argue to you today that for Canada to work, we have to embrace financial and environmental resiliency, but also that both are based on social resiliency. And social resiliency is strengthened through powerful civic engagement and good public discourse. From our indigenous brothers and sisters, to refugees from Uganda or Vietnam or Colombia or Syria, to the young woman who's moved here from halfway across the world to put her engineering degree to good use. We belong to each other. You may be familiar with the famous quote from Mother Teresa. She once said, if we have no peace, it is because that we have forgotten that we belong to each other. That sounds crazily naive, doesn't it? And maybe a little bit utopian. But I believe that the world works best, that our communities work best, that Canada works best. When we ask ourselves that most Canadian of questions, how can I help? And by contrast, when we don't look after one another, 
there are very real impacts to our community and to the world. I'm not going to go on and on tonight about the 2013 floods, but bear with me for a minute. I do want to talk a little bit about that. I don't want to so much talk about the environmental disaster, which at the time was the costliest natural disaster in Canadian history. Almost certainly, by the way, will be uh, surpassed by what's happening in Wood Buffalo today. But every year in June, we celebrate the flood. That sounds like a very strange thing to say, doesn't it? We're not really celebrating the flood. What we are celebrating is the tremendous community spirit that brought us together as a community at that time. I have many, many stories about the flood, but I'll tell you this. At the height of the crisis, in the Emergency Operations Center, if you think about the Emergency Operations Center, imagine every movie you've ever seen about NASA and imagine Mission Control in Houston. That's the Emergency Operations Center. Giant video walls, a bunch of cubicles in front of them, dedicated public servants and private sector volunteers working together to solve problems, and it's chaos. But at the height of the flood, while the waters were still cresting, I found myself overwhelmed, inundated, if you like, with offers of people asking that most Canadian of questions. How can I help? What can I do? So in the middle of all of that, I pulled aside some of my dedicated colleagues in the public service and I said, folks, you have to start managing the volunteer response from now. We have to be ready for when it's safe for us to be able to deal with volunteers. And I do love public servants. And I think one lesson of the floods and of the fires in Fort McMurray is that we should live in gratitude every single day, that we live in a place where government works and where dedicated public servants go to work every single day to keep us safe and to make our communities work even better. It's an amazing thing. That said, oh yes, let's hear it for the public servants. I have, I have nearly 20,000 colleagues at the city of Calgary. They pick up the trash, they drive the buses, they fix the roads, they drive the buses and the trains. I think I said that one already. They teach our kids how to swim. They look after the environment in our community and they work behind the scenes to make all of that work and they're the first on the scene in accidents. And I am tremendously proud of every single one of my colleagues. That said, the folks I pulled aside to deal with the volunteer response. Sometimes public servants can get a little well public servanty. And when I pulled them aside to talk about this, they immediately set to fighting with one another. Volunteer response? What if people don't know what they're doing? What if somebody gets hurt? What about the risk? That's the most dangerous word you can say to a public servant, risk. And I let them keep fighting. Some days, um, as the waters started to recede, I finally left the emergency operations center late on a Sunday night so that I could get a little bit of sleep. And when I left, the people in charge of the volunteer uh, operations were still fighting. When I woke up a few hours later, I heard on the radio, if you're willing to help out with the cleanup after the flood, the city of Calgary requests that you meet at McMahon Stadium in two hours' time. You can imagine I sat up straight in bed and went, what? So I phoned and I said, what's going on? And they said, well, your worship. It's always bad when they start with your worship. <laughs> well, your worship, when you left last night, we didn't really have a plan. And I said, yeah, that was four hours ago. And they said, well, we knew that if you came back that you'd be, and we didn't have a plan, you'd be really mad at us. And I said, okay. And they said, so we're going to do this thing at McMahon Stadium. We're going to get everyone to meet in the central location, and then we're going to disperse them to the various locations they have to go to. And I said, OK. What I don't get is why didn't you tell anybody? Because it's Monday morning. You've given people two hours' notice. Nobody's going to show up. Well, your worship, they said, that's kind of on purpose. Okay, 
because you see, we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> so we figure if a couple hundred people show up today, then we'll be able to process them, we'll figure out our game, and we'll be ready for many, many more people tomorrow. And I said, all right, either I'm sleep deprived or I've been in this business too long because what you just said almost makes sense. But you're not going to get a couple hundred people. You'll be lucky to get 30 or 40 people show up. But I suppose I should actually go over and say hello. So I made my way, threw on some pants, made my way over to McMahon Stadium, and many of you have seen the pictures of what I actually encountered. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people. In coveralls and work boots they came, in tank tops and flip-flops they came, young and old, with skills, with fewer skills, <laughs> all asking that same most Canadian of questions. How can I help? There was no PA system. And when I got there, one of my colleagues, Jason from Calgary Emergency Management, was standing on top of one of those folding plastic tables you see in banquet halls attempting to yell at the crowd. This was the only moment, I think, during the entire crisis where I actually added value. Because you see, I had gotten a lift to the stadium in a borrowed vehicle, which I had borrowed from the fire chief. It took him a long time to get it back because it had lights and sirens. <laughs> tells you a lot about asset management in fire departments in Canada. See, every time I say that, he says, actually, it says a lot more about the fact that you can't tell the mayor, give me back my car. <laughs> I realized if this thing had lights and sirens, that it must also have the voice of God. The radio you never want to hear behind you on a road late at night. So I climbed up on top of that table, I reached into the driver's side window, pulled out the radio, and started to address the crowd. My colleague Jason, who had been on the table, was at the bottom, and he yelled up at me, send them home. <laughs> We've run out of forms. <laughs> this is true. So I looked out at the crowd, I took a deep breath, I swallowed hard, visions of municipal lawyers danced in front of my eyes. The thought of municipal lawyers dancing is somewhat terrifying. And I said, folks, we've run out of forms. There's no more room on the school buses. But you know what? You've all come here to help. You've all come here to help your neighbors. Just go help. Just go help. Go to the neighborhoods that you know have been badly impacted. You may have to go door to door. You probably won't. It'll probably become very clear what you can do. Just go help. And they went. And they went. And they went. In the hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands, they went. What followed was a wave of power and resilience and humanity that I have never before witnessed. Sharon Paul didn't mention, though I've alluded to it a couple times, that I actually am an academic. I keep reminding Mount Royal University that I'm just on leave and they have to hold my job for me. Got that, Wob? Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> did you? You didn't make them put you on leave? Oh, a braver man than I. Um, <laughs> Anyway, um, and if and when I return to being an academic, this will probably be the rest of my life's work. How do people organize themselves, and how do you take that, and I'm going to come back to this, but how do you take that same power and resilience and humanity and apply it to issues like homelessness and poverty, environmental justice, prosperity for our indigenous brothers and sisters, all of it. But that's what we saw. We saw that people had that inherent resiliency. And it happened in big ways and it happened in small ways. As the water started to recede, 
I got into the habit of taking walks in the neighborhoods that were flooded. No security, no media, no drama, no hoopla. I just went for walks. If I could steal away from the emergency operations center for an hour. And I just talked to people. And people were incredibly generous in inviting me into their homes, helping me understand how the disaster had affected them. And I remember one of the first walks that I took. I was in a community in Calgary called Rideau Roxborough, just across the Mission Bridge on 4th Street. And there was a tiny little house there. And I met Sam. Sam's an elementary school student, second grade, and his mom, Lori. And they were kind enough to invite me into their home, or what was left of it. It had been stripped down to the studs. Volunteers were working hard to take everything out, and Sam and his mom and his dad were trying to figure out how they were going to deal with the rebuilding of their home. And Lori looked at me and she said, Mayor, you know, I don't have any cabinets or any dishes. I don't have any appliances left. And I don't have any way to cook meal for my family. But you know what, Mayor? Tonight for dinner, we had hot shepherd's pie. And sometimes when I'm having a bad day, I never have bad days. I get to live in Calgary. Occasionally I have bad days. Sometimes when I'm having a bad day, I think about that shepherd's pie. I think about the hands that made it, that boiled the potatoes and peeled them and mashed them, that turned the whole mixture into a casserole dish, covered it tightly with tin foil, and stopped to think for a second, I am never gonna see my casserole dish again. <laughs> but that doesn't matter, because somewhere out there, there's a family that hasn't had a hot meal in days, and I want them to eat the shepherd's pie while it's hot. That's looking after our own. That's answering the question, how can I help? And that's the core of building a resilient city. I want to talk about cities a little bit. Cities are not only economic drivers and cultural hubs, they're the beating heart of our nation, they're the beating heart of most nations. Most people don't know that right now, this minute, for the first time in human history, the majority of people in the world are urban people. The majority of people in the world live in cities. And despite the national stories that we tell ourselves about Canada, we are actually one of the most urban nations on earth. More than 80% of us live in cities. Tangent. The brand new premier of Alberta came to speak to the Alberta Urban Municipalities Association. It was one of the five premiers I've had in the five and a half years that I've been mayor, by the way. <laughs> Did I mention where he was speaking? The Alberta Urban Municipalities Association. He was talking to all the mayors and all the council members of the towns and cities in Alberta. And he gave a great speech. But in the background of his speech were images of Alberta. And not one of the images had more than two people in it. They were images of moose and mountains, of lakes and loons. We don't even have loons in Alberta. <laughs> of bears and beavers, and at the very, very, very end, a shot of the Edmonton Folk Festival. Because those are the stories we tell ourselves about who we are. Yet we are, in fact, incredibly urbanized. Late last year, at the largest gathering of world leaders in history, at the United Nations. You may have seen the news coverage. No, there wasn't any. There was news coverage that Justin Trudeau was there, and there was news coverage that the Pope was there, and so was Shakira. <laughs> but they didn't really say what the Prime Minister and Shakira were talking about. What they were talking about, other than their selfie game, was about something called the Global Goals, the Sustainable Development Goals, which were agreed to by every nation in this world at the United Nations. They embody an extraordinary vision, a vision that by 2030, that's not that far away, we will have a world free of poverty, hunger, disease, and wants. We'll have a world of universal respect for human rights and human dignity, a world of equal opportunity, 
permitting the full realization of human potential. You can sum it up in four words. A global agreement that in this world there should be no one left behind. The vast majority of Canadians understand that. They internalize it. We as a nation have an extraordinarily large role to play and we need to take our seat at the table. I was thrilled, by the way. Um, I've, I often tell a story of how Canada inadvertently led to millions of deaths by not fulfilling our commitments the last time the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Malaria, and Tuberculosis was replenished. And I was thrilled to see that the Canadian government is now hosting the next round of replenishment um, here in Canada and has made the first pledge to that fund that will help save millions of lives and prevent 300 million infections worldwide. It's an important thing for us to do. It's an important thing for Canada to play our proper role in the world. But I want to zone in on goal number 11 of those 17 global goals. Goal number 11 is about cities. It talks about making cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, there's that word again, and sustainable. And certainly the work that we're doing in Calgary is strengthening our ability to weather those shocks, like floods, windstorms, wildfires, snow events, one of the funniest things, by the way, about being on the 100 resilient cities list is that one of the biggest environmental shocks Calgary faces is wind. We've actually had to open our emergency operations center because of high winds more than we've had to for any other thing. But the 100 resilient cities website doesn't include wind as a category, so we're actually listed under hurricanes. <laughs> While those two rivers are mighty, <laughs> It's a challenge to think about if we get a hurricane, something else is happening, and it's very bad. But also the chronic stressors, the economic climate, the lack of affordable housing, persistent poverty uh, that face our city. And of course, when we talk about resiliency, I can't get away in Winnipeg without suggesting that we also have to build the physical infrastructure that will protect us from future flooding. And here in Winnipeg, you know a lot about that kind of infrastructure. Uh, and boy, I hope while I'm here, I get the chance to see some of that. But when we talk about resiliency, we also mean in the economic sense. And I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about what economic resiliency means uh, to my land, to your land, and to this great nation. I've been troubled lately, and I know exactly where I'm standing as I say this by some of the language that we've been hearing around capitalism versus the climate. That's uh, the subtitle of a popular book these days. I don't think I get it. No, scratch that. I know I don't get it. I don't get the Leap Manifesto. I believe fully that it is possible to help people live lives of dignity, to help people look after themselves and their families, without destroying the planet. But I also believe that to vilify industries we don't like, while calling industries we do like low carbon, as the LEAP Manifesto does, I guarantee you no childcare worker in this country thinks of him or herself as working in a low carbon industry, is just wrong. It's actually not about looking after our own. Chris Turner has written an excellent book, you should all read it, called The Leap, which is precisely about how the world can transition to a low-carbon economy. I asked him recently, what do you think of The Leap Manifesto? They took the title of your book, and he gave me a piece of his mind, and I said, is it accurate for me to say that this is a leap too far? And he said, too far? It's a leap in a random direction without knowing anything about aerodynamics. Look, we all know that we're moving to a low carbon world. We all know that at some point, whether it's our grandchildren or our grandchildren's grandchildren, someone will say, you used to burn that stuff? We know we're moving in that direction. So the question then becomes, what is the responsible thing to do as a community? What is the resilient thing to do as a community? Do you take a giant leap? Or do you manage the transition in a way that I would argue to you is more responsible? Let me start by suggesting to you that we are a very, very lucky place. We're lucky in so many ways in this country. 
But one of the ways in which we are lucky is that we are blessed with extraordinary natural resources. We shouldn't begrudge ourselves. We shouldn't act as though that is some burden that we have to carry. We should be proud of it. And we should know that if you're sitting on a resource that is declining in value over time, you need to convert that resource into something that's useful. You need to convert it into education. You need to convert it into affordable housing. You need to convert it into cash, like the Norwegians have done, so that you have an opportunity to look after future generations when that resource is no longer valued or is gone. And we've done something, and I've been very uh, high level so far, but I want to get quite specific. We've done something very interesting in this country. It is, by the way, exactly the same thing that we have done in the Ontario auto industry, which is we've crafted an enormously important industry, the biggest industry in the country, as a matter of fact, and we've crafted it with only one customer, the United States. And thanks in no small part to Canadian innovation and ingenuity and research done at our universities, the United States has taken advantage of technology and our only customer has become our number one competitor. So we've got a difficult situation. The other thing that you might be interested to know, um, I'm always surprised that people particularly in Central and Eastern Canada don't know this, is that pretty much anywhere east of Toronto, when you go to heat your home or when you go to fill up the tank in your car, you're actually not using Canadian energy. You're using oil that has come from places like Venezuela or Algeria in tankers up the St. Lawrence Seaway or by pipeline under the St. Lawrence Seaway from Maine. Uh, perhaps I don't know where it came from when it got to Maine. Um, fueling that carbon economy. The other thing that most people east of Toronto don't know is that when you every day hear in the news what the price of oil is, it almost hit $50 this week, people were popping champagne corks uh, in Calgary. We don't get that. In fact, we sell our most valuable resource, a declining resource, a carbon heavy resource, at a massive discount to the world market. That discount can be as much as 60%. I think we can all agree that the worst possible thing you can do is sell a carbon intensive resource at a massive discount to the market. The way to fix that is through smarter market access, whether it's liquid natural gas or crude oil. This may sound like the mayor of Calgary talking about his own self-interest. It is. But it's also the mayor of Calgary talking about the interest of the nation. Let me talk to you for a second about cold hard cash. If we got market value for that oil, just that one change, then every provincial deficit in this country and the federal government's deficit before this last budget, because it was really big, would be cleared. We wouldn't be taking on debt for future generations. So the responsible public policy option here is, I think, somewhat more complicated than most people are discussing, and we have to talk about that. I'm just going to digress for a second and tell you a little bit about what's going on in Calgary because people are always asking me, how are you handling the current economic downturn? We're feeling this downturn in a very much a more acute way than most of Canada. Our unemployment rate has gone from far below the national average to just above the national average in just, just over a year. We're not used to being there. Many, many of our friends and neighbours have lost their jobs and while Calgary continues to create jobs, at a great pace, we can't ignore the fact that many of our neighbours are feeling a lot of pain. But things are changing. When I graduated from my undergraduate degree 23 years ago, I was a child prodigy. I was very, very young. <laughs> Since I'm 29 now, I must have been six. At that time, oil and gas accounted for 50% of Calgary's economy, 50% of our GDP. In the 23 years since then, we've had nearly $1 trillion of investments in Alberta energy, and oil and gas has gone from 50% of our GDP to 30%. We've been diversifying and growing without anybody noticing. But we need to continue to do that. And in a time of economic downturn, it is, I think, fair to ask, what can government do? And I would argue that government has three important roles. The first is, we need to keep building good stuff. 
We need to continue to build stuff that citizens need, to build a community where innovators, entrepreneurs, and creative thinkers want to live and work, where a person at the top of their game says, I want to be there. Because we know in economic development that jobs don't attract people, that people attract jobs, and that people are attracted by great communities. Everyone wants to live in a great city and in a great community. And that's one of the things we need to focus on. And I'm very, very pleased that provincial and federal governments uh, around the country understand this, that we are investing in building that horrible word infrastructure. How about in cutting people's commutes, in making cities more environmentally sustainable, um, and investing in important things like public transit. Um, those are the sorts of things we need to keep doing, particularly at a time when interest rates are as low as they ever be, mathematically as low as they really could be when people are out of work and when construction costs are lower now than they were years ago. It's the responsible thing for us to do to keep building. The second thing governments can do is to encourage a better future. We always say government can't pick winners and losers, but we sure can encourage them. And we do that by creating an environment where small business, local business, entrepreneurs and others can succeed. And I could go on and on about Calgary's economic diversification strategy, but I'll spare you. I will tell you, however, that the third role of government is perhaps the most important, and that is to keep people from falling through the cracks, to ensure that people know that they live in a community that looks after them and a community that cares for them. Fort McMurray. Over 80,000 people were evacuated. That is about the same size as the evacuation during the Calgary floods, which was at that time the largest peacetime evacuation in Canadian history. But it is a much bigger deal. Not only is it much more terrifying, and those of you who've seen the pictures know how terrifying that has been uh, for families in that area, but it is logistically extremely challenging. I'm so happy that the first batch of people are going to be going back tomorrow. And in fact, uh, Dr. Trimby, you'd be thrilled to know in, given your former past as a leader in the Alberta government, that the Alberta government has done an amazing job. I am so proud of my premier. I am so proud of every public servant in the Alberta government for the way they manage this. I like to say they've learned a little bit from what we did in Calgary during the floods. But the single most, I'll just, I'll tell you this, the single biggest challenge in a disaster like this after the disaster is uncertainty. People don't know what happened to my house. When can I go home? Can my kids finish the school year? What are we going to do about grade 12 grad? What about all my papers? I just learned this one this week. Did my safety deposit box at the bank burn? Turns out none of them did, by the way. But the question of uncertainty is the most important one, which is why, as Dr. Trimby alluded to earlier, we allowed people to go back and look at their homes. It wasn't possible logistically to do that in Fort McMurray, so what did they do instead? They used super high definition satellite imagery, supplemented by drones, supplemented by good old fashioned shoe leather of assessors walking up and down the streets with clipboards and iPads, and created a website where you can zoom in on your house and see the property damage report and see what's going on with your house even if you can't physically be there. Brilliant. Um, and certainly very, very helpful for people as they're thinking about what we're doing. The most interesting thing about the flood in the Fort McMurray evacuation, though, is how community looks after one another. We evacuated 80,000 people in Calgary, and at the absolute peak in our refugee centers, we were taking care of about 1,500 people. Where was everyone else? Well, they were staying with friends and family and co-workers, sometimes strangers, who said, you don't want to sleep in a cot in a gym. My couch is marginally more comfortable. And that's really what happened. And the same thing has happened in the Fort McMurray fires. The city of Calgary is looking after about 2,000 people, and it's our pride to do that, and they need our help. But the vast majority of people um, have found ways to manage through this. And I think that is really about resiliency and about the network coming together. So I've talked a little bit about environmental resiliency. I've talked a little bit about financial resiliency. And I've alluded to many times, and now I want to really get into the topic of social resiliency. Social resiliency is about the ability of a community to rally around itself at a very human, very personal level. Just because of the topic of this year's uh, seminar, of which this lecture is a part, which is about secularism and religion, 
I do want to talk a little bit about faith. And I come to that from a very interesting perspective. In fact, it's really funny because my notes don't say this because my office who looked at these notes, though I wrote them myself, changed it because they hate when I talk about my own faith. (laughs) But I'm going to talk about my own faith. I was surprised about two weeks ago to see headlines uh, in every major newspaper in the world saying that London has now elected the first Muslim mayor of a Western city. (laughs) My feelings were a little bit hurt. But I mention that for a reason. When I was first elected in 2010, the issue of my faith was not an issue in any way in the election. In fact, it came up the election twice, once in sort of a negative way and once in quite a positive way, where basically people were saying, isn't it nice that we're so enlightened that we could elect this guy? (laughs) Both times, both times, the backlash against that was extraordinary. In fact, the article that, aren't we so lucky to be so enlightened, let's pat ourselves on the back, received more complaints to the Calgary Herald newspaper, newsroom than any other article that year that they had published. And the complaints were, you know, there were a few racists, sure, but the complaints were all the same, which was, we don't care. Could you please write about what he thinks about transit? <laughs> and so the day after I was elected, I quite suddenly found myself very, very famous. Time Magazine wanted to talk to me and CNN, and Al Jazeera, and much to my surprise, none of them wanted to talk about my stunning good looks, my plank, my ability to cuddle baby pandas, my other plank, my one-armed push-ups. Sorry, I was going off topic a little bit there. I don't know what I was thinking about. Um, Vogue magazine never called, did I mention? Anyway. Again, I I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, They weren't interested in my professor comes from literally 0% in the polls to win an election. They weren't even interested in my racial background. They were interested only in my faith. And at that point, I had a choice. And my choice was I could just not talk about this, because certainly the people of Calgary didn't care, so why should we talk about this? But I didn't make that choice. I actually made the opposite choice. I decided that in a world like the one in which we live, a world that feels so broken at times, Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin in a speech at the University of Calgary just yesterday suggested that dealing with diversity is the single most important human challenge right now. And I decided that it made sense to tell a good story, to tell a story about a place where pluralism works, a place where diversity works, a place of tolerance, and, I, and I, by the way, I use that word very advisedly. And so I did, and I continue to talk about that. And one of the great delights of my life is that I get to spend tons of time with people of faith. I find myself in mosques and synagogues and churches and temples and mandirs and gurdwaras and community halls and school gyms with congregations all the time. My favorite moment ever was when I had to give the Palm Sunday sermon at a United Church. (laughs) They're so inclusive, the United Church. (laughs) It was a great sermon too, gotta say. (laughs) It may have been made up on the spot when I realized it was Palm Sunday after I walked in. Anyway. (laughs) I used the metaphor of Jesus entering the city to talk about how we all enter into our communities. (laughs) Not bad, huh? (laughs) Anyway, whenever I talk to these religious groups, actually, I'm going to tell you another story. One of the first things I did after I became mayor is I, and I do it every year, is I got to light the community menorah for the Festival of Hanukkah. Now, for those of you that don't know, the community menorah, you know, a public menorah in a city hall or whatever, is a relatively new phenomenon. And it started uh, with the Chabad movement, um, who tend to be very, who are, I shouldn't say who tend to be, very orthodox people. 
And so when I went to light the first community menorah, from the 100 meter walk from my office to the atrium of City Hall, at least four different people stopped me along the way and said, whatever you do, don't touch the women. Do I have a reputation for this? <laughs> um, it's a whole different mayors. Anyway, um, so I was already a little bit wound up. And although people in the Jewish community had been great supporters and allies and friends for many years, and particularly in my election campaign, I had not met the Chabad people. And so the rabbi came up to me, and you have to imagine, he's got his hat and his beard and his big black coat, and he's a big guy, Rabbi Menachem. And he walked up to me and he said, you have caused me such a problem. And I said, oh no, <laughs> I never expected this. And I said, uh-huh, and he reaches into his pocket and pulls out a crumpled piece of velvet, and he says, do you have any idea how hard it is to find a purple kippah? <laughs> and I put it on my head, and it stays in my office all the time. As he later told me, purple is not a common color for Jewish skull caps, but luckily he had a son at a rabbinical school in New York who ordered one for me. <laughs> but whenever I talk to religious communities, I always say the same thing. And I say that we, as people of faith, have so much more that unites us than that which divides us. And when you think about those common values, when you think about how every faith has a concept in some form or the other of the Good Samaritan, when you think about those values, the necessity to leave the world better than you found it, the absolute requirement for service, the inherent dignity of every human being, then we as people of faith have an ability to really lead, to lead in building community, to lead in helping our neighbors. And that too is a way that makes us strong. One of my proudest moments in my time as mayor was when the city of Calgary unanimously endorsed, my council unanimously endorsed, our poverty reduction strategy, a secular document but a secular document that is rooted in a very simple concept that resonates, I think, in all faith communities. The concept is, my neighbor's strength is my strength. And it resonates because we know that the core strength of our community is not that there's carbon atoms in the ground somewhere nearby in some parts of the country. It is not that there are maple trees with great sap in them in other parts of the country. It is that we have figured out in this nation when we are at our best, a very simple truth. It is a truth that evades too many people in this broken world of ours. And that truth is just this. Nous sommes ici ensemble. We are all in it together. Our neighbor's strength is our strength. The success of any one of us is the success of every one of us. And more important, the failure of any one of us is the failure of every one of us. That our neighbor's pain is also our pain. You know, as we have looked at this economic downturn in Calgary, we've noticed something very interesting. And that is that it's not just enough to make sure that the community has the opportunities and resources available to our neighbors. It's also that we have to give our neighbors the permission and the confidence to be able to ask for help. In the economic downturn here in Calgary, in Calgary, I should say, we have a lot of people who just are not familiar with feeling hardship. And rather than reaching out to the community, they can push themselves deeper in crisis because they don't recognize that they live in a community where people care for them. They don't recognize that they live in a community where we look after our own. And that is a very interesting thing for me to remind people that this is what the community is there for. Social resilience is based on that word that I use advisedly, tolerance. A lot of folks say tolerance is a terrible word. I just don't want to be tolerated by you. I want to be expect, accepted. I want to be respected, but I would argue to you 
that that value of tolerance, that value of pluralism, what I call the generous sharing of opportunity with everyone in our community, that innate sense that every single one of us, regardless of what we look like, regardless of where we come from, regardless of how we worship, regardless of whom we love, that every single one of us right here, right now, deserves the chance to live a great Canadian life. That is the core promise of our community, and that is the value that allows us to build social resiliency. By the way, it's one of the reasons why, on the anniversary of the flood, every year we celebrate that flood, we celebrate the community spirit that came out of the flood. We celebrate Neighbor Day. Neighbor Day is a day when people, what do you think? Meet their neighbors. They might have a barbecue, but instead of having it in their backyard, they have it in their front yard, and they invite their neighbors over. They might do a plants exchange. They might have a tea party. If they're organized enough, they'll close down the street for a block party. They'll haul all the barbecues. We, we like our barbecues in June in Calgary. They'll haul all their barbecues to a park in the middle of the community and have a progressive potluck barbecue. I don't know if you need a permit for that. I've got to figure that one out. <laughs> one of my favorite examples of Neighbor Day was a community association where they asked me to come first thing in the morning and all they had was Tim Hortons coffee, because it's Canada, and a whiteboard, and the whiteboard said on one half of it, I need, and on the other half of it, I can and neighbors were supposed to write what they could do or what they needed. And a woman had written, I need someone to fix my lawn mower. And so I asked her about it. And she was an older woman and she said to me, well, my husband always mowed the lawn, but I've lost my husband. And I'm happy to mow the lawn, but the lawn mower is broken. And I don't know how to fix it. And of course, on the other side, someone had written, I can mow your lawn. Those are the things that make a difference in how we live in community. But I have to tell you that this picture that I am painting, this utopian, if you like, naive picture, is incredibly fragile. That social resilience must be protected always. It must be fought for every day, like that great Canadian philosopher Bruce Co Coburn puts it. Nothing worth having comes without some kind of fight. We have to protect it from the voices of intolerance, the voices of divisiveness, the voices of small-mindedness, and the voices of hatred. We have to look after our own. And I'll argue to you that that means investing in two things, better public discourse and stronger civic engagement. People ask me sometimes what I don't like about my life. I like pretty much everything about my life. But I will tell you that I am deeply troubled by the souring public discourse that we see in our communities. Petty partisanship, ugly personal arguments, so many of them. Some of you will know that I made some news. I tend to make news when I talk, <laughs> um, show up, breathe. Um, but you know, we've had an, we had an example where the city of Calgary had to cancel in-person open houses on a bus project, of all things, because of threats of violence and intimidation of city staff over a bus. And it wasn't just that we are trying to put our colleagues in bubble wrap. It was the fact that when there was that much shouting going on, anyone who had a different point of view couldn't be heard. What kind of engagement is that? It just doesn't work. Everyday partisan discourse, particularly when females in positions of power are targets, is something that troubles me an enormous amount. We all know that social media is a haven for terrible trolls. Maybe some people think I'm one of them. But it's become so much worse over the last few years. When Annette suggested that I use social media to decent effect in that first election, I like to think that I did. And the reason I did was because I found that it was very, very possible to have really authentic dialogue with people, even though it was only 140 characters. That dialogue is nigh impossible now, because even when you are engaging with someone, 
and, and it's an open forum, Every, everyone can read your conversation, people tend to jump on it and just start yelling. I actually told a guy recently on Twitter, do you also eavesdrop on conversations in coffee shops and just start yelling irrelevant things? He said no. But as irritating as this is, I would suggest to you that that kind of blind partisanship of not listening to one another not only doesn't help improve the community, it actually makes it harder. You know, just last week, a provincial, a female provincial politician in Alberta was the subject of violent threats online. It wasn't the first time. Just months ago, the environment's office, the environment minister's office was called and the caller threatened to shoot everyone in the office because he disagreed with the government's climate change policy. These are not isolated incidents, particularly not online. Everyone in a position of power gets this kind of abuse, but I gotta tell you something, it is so much worse if you're a woman. And we as a community have to come to terms with that. People call me fat, they call me loudmouthed, they call me ugly, I can take all of that. But you know what? I don't get rape threats. And that's something that we as a society have to come to terms with very, very, very seriously. Because public good is at risk if public discourse is at risk. I mean, think about it for a second. Think about the woman who decides to enter politics against all barriers, against systems that are stacked against her, especially if she wants to have a young family. And what happens? She wakes up in the morning and is greeted by threats of a violent sexual attack. Think she still likes her job? Think she still wants to be a public servant? Think that we can actually benefit from her knowledge and experience and wisdom? It's not part of the job to accept that kind of abuse. And we have to stand up for, against that. We have to say that we as a society are poorer when fewer and fewer people want to enter public life because of the environment they face. It's not about bubble wrapping politicians, it's about honoring and respecting people who make the choice to go into public service and helping and support them in that, whether you agree with them or not, whether you're a member of their party or whether you vehemently disagree with them. Let's honor the fact that they made the choice and we are all richer when people make the choice to enter public service. But it's not just politicians. Think of the citizen who actually wants to voice their support for a project at a public meeting, but can't because they're scared that their neighbors are gonna yell them down or they'll get verbally abused, or sometimes they fear for their safety. Think that neighbor is ever gonna to go to a public meeting again? Think of the new Canadian, an immigrant or maybe a refugee who reads online that people think they're a drain on society or they don't deserve an opportunity here. Think they're gonna think this is a place that's welcoming and a place where they can succeed. We need smart people of every background to enter politics. We need every voice to be heard as we build our communities. We need the very best people from around the world to want to live here, work here, and thrive here. And it doesn't happen when you directly or indirectly attack people with sour and nasty public discourse. Instead, we turn people away, our communities become stagnant, and our cities repel talents. It's exactly the opposite of the world that we need. The other thing, and my final point, that I'd like to make with you tonight is to talk about how all of this, social resiliency, financial resiliency, environmental resiliency, is based on a core of strong civic engagement. I told you the story about McMahon Stadium before. And I told you that I am wondering how we take what happens in disaster, that power, that humanity, that resilience, and apply it to poverty, homelessness, justice, prosperity for our indigenous brothers and sisters. Because I firmly believe that it's not about the politicians. It's not even about the university presidents when we think about making extraordinary change in our community. It's about everyday people. Everyday people with their everyday hands and their everyday voices and their everyday hearts making extraordinary change in the community. And our job, as those who sometimes get a microphone, is to set the expectation, to set the table, to encourage people to bring their own light and their own value to the communities that we serve. I have two buttons on today. I was just pinned with the second one. It says, this is what a feminist looks like. 
from, from the Center for Gender and... Ah, I got it backwards. Women and Gender Studies here at the University of Winnipeg. I don't want to talk about that button. I want to talk about the other button. The other button, you can't see it from out there, but it's, the other button is a big number three, and I wear it every day. It stands for a very simple social movement, and that social movement is called Three Things for Calgary. It is exactly what it sounds like. Every year, every citizen is encouraged to do three things for the community. They could be big things. Join the board of a nonprofit. Fight for some cause that you believe in. They could be small things. Shovel your neighbor's walk. Is that a good example for Winnipeg? Does it snow here? <laughs> I tried making that example in Vancouver, and they just looked at me. <laughs> but it's all about asking yourself two questions. What do I care about? What am I good at? And the intersection of those two questions is where miraculous things happen. When we first launched this program in Calgary, I was very skeptical. I said to the super volunteers who I had pulled together to answer the question, how do we get more people involved in the community? It took them 45 days to come up with their name of the committee the Mayor's Committee on Civic Engagement. <laughs> they could not have done worse. I've told that story so many times. They actually came up to me a year ago, I swear this is true, and said, Mayor, we're sick of you making fun of the name of the committee. <laughs> so we had focus groups. <laughs> and we decided to change the name of the committee. The Mayor's Civic Engagement Committee. <laughs> that is actually true. <laughs> But when they first gave me that idea, I said to myself, you guys have done something miraculous. You've created something that is simultaneously too simple and too complicated. It's too simple because we're not telling people what to do. We know when the research shows the number one reason people don't get involved in their community is, it's not lack of time, it's not lack of money. Any guesses? That's right, it's nobody asked me. So we gotta ask people. So we need to match people with nonprofits. We gotta sort them out this way. And it's too complicated because you're asking people to do three things, not just one thing, and you want to keep the barrier, the barrier to entry very low. And I was convinced that the two things that I thought were weaknesses were actually the strengths of the program. In not telling people what to do, we give people the freedom and the ability to make up their own minds. And I have a million stories of people who have done things that you and I would never imagine to make extraordinary change in their community. My favorite one is the woman who had a terrifying night at the emergency room of the children's hospital with her daughter and then a terrifying day the next day, and when they were at home safely, she reflected on the experience and thought about what could have made it better. And now every year, she has a toothbrush drive for the children's hospital. But not for children's toothbrushes, for adult toothbrushes. Because she knows that a parent who's taking their child to the emergency room does not think to grab their toiletries kit. And the simple act of being able to brush your teeth in the morning makes you feel a little more alive and a little more human, but more important, it reminds you that you live in a community where people care about you. I'd never come up with that. That's the power of this, and tens of thousands of people in Calgary have signed up for this. Communities across the country have signed up for it. We have three things for London, Ontario, three things for Wood Buffalo. In Toronto, for some reason, they turned it into two for Toronto. <laughs> and I called and I said, there's a reason it's three, because it's not about doing an act of service. Of course, it's not about doing three acts of service. It's about creating a lifetime habit of service. And they said, yeah, but two sounds better. <laughs> Next year, we will celebrate Canada's sesquicentennial. And I have two goals for Canada's 150th birthday. The first goal is I want to be able to say the word sesquicentennial as much as possible. Because it's super fun to say. And I just learned it in French. Sesquicentennial. Huh? Huh? Um, but my second goal, actually my dream, my dream is that every Canadian use the opportunity of our nation's 150th birthday to give a gift to the nation. And that we as a nation, therefore, give a gift to the world. Actually, three gifts. So my dream for next year is three things for Canada. And I hope that every Canadian will take up this cause. I hope all of you will take it up here in Winnipeg, asking yourself that most Canadian of questions, how can I help? I want to wrap up with one final story. I've spoken a lot 
over the last several months about the greatest humanitarian crisis in history, that of course being the crisis of refugees from the Middle East, particularly from Syria. And I'm very proud of the way that our communities and our country have responded. But there was a point in December after Paris when the public discourse had hardened, when not only were people asking very difficult questions, but some people were saying some very difficult things. And in the middle of that, we organized a community forum in Calgary on the issue of homelessness. Uh, not on homelessness, excuse me, on refugees. And I gotta tell you, I was actually a little bit nervous to go. It was a completely open forum. I didn't know who was gonna show up. I didn't know what they were gonna say. I didn't know how that would potentially sour our public discourse or change our community response. And I walked in and the place was packed to the rafters. And it was full of priests and imams and rabbis, of grandmothers, of kids who should have been in school, of people of that very, very special ilk that can only be described by the term church ladies. <laughs> and they were all asking that most Canadian of questions. How can I help? And I stood at the podium at the bottom of that theater and a woman stood up at the top, a First Nations woman. I know this because the first thing she said is, I am a proud First Nations woman. I am from the Siksika Nation. And I thought to myself, oh boy. She is going to ask a very legitimate question. Why are we helping all of these newcomers when we have so many problems here at home? And I had an answer. I was ready to answer it, but there was such a nice feeling in the room and I thought, what a shame that we're gonna have this discussion now. And she said, Mayor, I've got a problem. And I said, okay, what's your problem? And she said, well, I've been working on my own and I have managed to round up enough elders who have the right regalia and I found a bunch of young guys who are willing to do the drumming, but I don't know when these new families are coming. And I looked at her, and I didn't know what she meant, so I said, I don't know what you mean. And she said, Mayor, have you not been reading the news? <laughs> I said, uh-huh. And she said, these people have been through a lot. They've been through things we can't even imagine. And it is unbelievably important that when they come here to start their new lives as Canadians, that they are welcomed here with the proper ceremony. And we want to make that happen. Woo! Now, of course, that statement, I should just stop there, but there is a denouement. Of course, that statement led to a lot of public servants being very public servanty and a weeks-long discussion about whether it was appropriate to do a smudge on people as they got off a plane at the airport. <laughs> it was decided that it was not. <laughs> so some weeks later, we welcomed 1,000 newcomer families to City Hall, to the place where I light the community menorah, to the place where we do Eid at City Hall every year, and the place where I proudly flick the light on the Christmas tree. I call it Calgary's living room. We had a thousand people there. There was a fair that had different services. Anyone who spoke Arabic in anywhere in the city was there. The Arabic speaking bus drivers were there to teach people how to use transit. The Arabic speaking zoo volunteers were there to invite people to the zoo. And Elder Leonard Batstein stood up there with me in his war bonnet and his regalia and did a very special blessing ceremony for these folks with the drums. And I looked over his shoulder, and I looked out in the crowd, and there were these two kind of big swarthy guys holding up handwritten signs. And one of them said, thank you, Calgary, and the other one said, thank you, Canada. And I said, you know what? We're looking after our own. Thank you all.
you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sit down. You've got more to do. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you for those uh, wonderful, uh, timely, uh, thought-provoking, and, and, and impassioned call for and to the public good. And, and thank you so much. And I'm sure our students have some uh, really vital questions themselves. And to uh, moderate the question and answer period, uh, I'd like to bring up Wab Canoe, member of the Manitoba Legislative Assembly. What a, uh, what a great speech, full of good humor and also uh, very inspirational. That was awesome. And now for my favorite uh, part of the day, question period. <laughs> Better you than me. <laughs> All right, so tonight's uh, questions uh, have been prepared by the professor for the Class Spring Institute, Dr. Ray Silvius, and two of his students, uh, Daniel Diamond and uh, my homegirl, Shafa. Where's Shafa? Oh, yes, okay. Awesome. So we are going to begin with uh, Daniel's question. Hi there. Thank you for the wonderful lecture. So poverty is a serious issue here in Winnipeg, as it is in many cities across the world. You have announced an ambitious plan to ensure that 95% of people in Calgary live above the poverty line by 2023. Can you elaborate on one specific policy, program, or even just idea that you consider to be especially important in achieving this goal? Thanks for that. Um, I want to uh, highlight the fact that we don't really have the right answer to the question on poverty in this country. There are many answers. I've long been an advocate, for example, of a minimum income program or a guaranteed annual income, uh, which I think it could be extraordinarily effective and has support across the political spectrum. But we can't wait for government to make these policy changes. We have to work hard at the community level. So our poverty reduction program in Calgary is called Enough for All. And there's a double meaning there. The first meaning, of course, is that in a prosperous place like this country, and don't get me wrong, I should have mentioned this in my speech, regardless of where we are in the economic cycle, this country remains one of the most prosperous places on earth. It remains one of the most educated places on earth. If we can't get this right and be a beacon for the world, nobody can get it right. And we have a certain responsibility to make that happen. All that said, the other meaning of enough for all is that we spend a lot of time, money, effort, and resources in the poverty sector, in quotes, and we ought to be able to get better outcomes. So we've really focused the enough for all strategy on this concept of my neighbor's strength is my strength. And I'll give you two quick examples of how we do that. The first is around financial empowerment which is really about helping people save, helping people build assets, and helping people manage their money, um, which is, sounds a bit trite, but is an extraordinarily important skill. And so we're spending a lot of time on financial empowerment. You know, simple things like encouraging low-income families to take advantage of the Canada Learning Bond, which is free money for your kids' education, but has horrifically low uptake. Um, and so, and also helping people develop their own financial strategies for themselves, which is involved, could involve retraining, could involve getting a better job, could involve managing their money or their bills in a different way. The second piece is really about connecting people to the resources that are available. So the program is called Community Hubs, and it's about creating places in neighborhoods where I can go and get help. And it doesn't matter if I'm a senior or a child or a single mom, because right now you get shuffled away to different places depending on what your precise needs are. And the idea is that you can go to these community hubs and be referred to the resources that can help you. They exist online. Um, you can always call 211. But also there are physical spaces. So sometimes these are purpose-built spaces. There's one across the street from City Hall, which are a little bit more expensive to run, but more comprehensive. Um, the one across the street from City Hall, by the way, the lead agency is actually the Calgary Police Service, because they have found that anti-poverty interventions and working with nonprofits is tremendously helpful for them to prevent the kinds of other things that the police have to do. But there are also other ways. So last year, I found myself at a weekend conference. It was the annual conference of the librarians. 
in Alberta. Whenever I say that, the men in the room have a very different reaction than the women in the room. But, and I said to them, you know, these community hub concept is so important. If only there was a place in the community where you had people who were really good at accessing information and resources and knew how to help people navigate complex information. Can you help me think of a place like that? And so sure enough, all the librarians across Alberta are super happy to convert public libraries into these community hubs. Because those are not only places of resources, but they're also places where people can go to understand that regardless of their personal circumstances, they're a part of this community. I'm going to invite up another student. And the uh, Dean of the Libraries, thanks you for that comment, Mayor Nenshi. Love libraries. <laughs> All right, uh, we're going to go now to another student from the class uh, in Spring Institute, uh, Shafa Denishvar. Uh, hi, well, first of all, thank you so much for your uh, very insightful uh, presentation. I'm sure we all learned a lot. Um, you spoke a lot about the uh, importance of public service. And my question to, uh, to you is that throughout the duration of your um, term in office, uh, you've brought in this uh, sense of positivity and optimism um, in, political, uh, in the political sphere in uh, Calgary and all around the country. Um, so I'm curious about what uh, you've done, if at all, in implementing that type of attitude in the public service and um, the administration side of city politics? Oh, great question. So my job is an interesting one, right? Um, I have a legislative role um, in my city council. I have no executive authority for the political science students in the room. It's a very interesting, although mayors are the only um, real political office in Canada that is elected by all the electors instead of an award or constituency. We have no executive authority or power. I don't have a cabinet. The civil service doesn't report to me. Um, it's purely a legislative role. But there is actually an important symbolic role in running the organization. I don't actually run the organization. There's a city manager who runs the organization. But people look to me for that leadership and inspiration. So I actually find myself at the helm in some ways of an organization with 20,000 employees um, who, as I mentioned earlier, have this wide variety of roles um, and, you know, a very, very large budget. And when I was first elected, people said, you know, your biggest problem is going to be that the colleagues at the city are going to be very wary of you because you've talked about delivering services better, you've talked about some of the problems in the city, and they're just going to shut down and say, this too shall pass. And so what we decided to do was really involve my colleagues across the city, and, and I know it sounds a bit Walmart-y, but I never say employees or staff. We're all colleagues. We all work together towards a common goal. To, you know, the guys who, I always say, my colleagues on the snowplows are out today. And people always sort of laugh. And like, do you also drive a snowplow? I'm like, no, the, the insurance. Um, <laughs> the insurance company said, absolutely not. Um, they saw the abstract. Um, but... At the very beginning, we brought them in and said, how can we do better here? And so to this day, I encourage my colleagues every day to ask themselves the same question multiple times a day. And that question is, how is what I am doing right now making it better for somebody to live here? How is what I am doing right now improving the community? And that's something I hammer home over and over and over again. And I find that it wasn't nearly as hard as I thought it would be because people have a great pride in their work. So one of my first initiatives, in fact, the only initiative we ran out of the mayor's office was an initiative called Cut Red Tape. And it's all about increasing efficiency in the public service and serving citizens more effectively. So the very first thing we did, because we didn't have any budget, is we just put up, literally put up posters at the water coolers and put a thing on the, on the intranet and on the email saying, what are your ideas to cut red tape? Only to city staff, to my colleagues. And I thought I was going to get three or four ideas, and I would make those people heroes, right? We would implement those ideas. We put them in posters all over the city and talk about how smart they were. And what actually happened is I received more than 300 suggestions from city colleagues across the whole city. And that was very enlightening to me because I realized that inherently my colleagues wanted to do a great job. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I'm going to go to work and screw over a citizen today. But 
too many times the rules, the processes, the procedures, the management style only gave them the option to screw someone over when someone called with a problem. And so we were suddenly able to really release this incredible passion for public service by saying to people, you know, actually we need your ideas and we need to do a better job of this. And I think that that has been uh, extremely helpful in doing it. And I'm not just blowing smoke. You know, you heard me today talk about how proud I am of my colleagues and how proud I am of people who've chosen a career in the public service, and I am. You know, for me, personally, I was a professor. I like writing about things. I like throwing tomatoes from the side of the room, right? Um, sometimes at my students. I never really thought I would be the one having the tomatoes tossed at him. Nobody tosses tomatoes at me, by the way. I do get to kiss a lot of babies. Um, do you get to kiss a lot of babies? It really is the best part of the job. If only I got those baby pandas. Sorry, mind wandering again. Um, anyway, but I fundamentally think that I've been given a very humbling gift. That I've been given seven years where I get to wake up every morning and go to work and know that I can make a difference for somebody today. And that is exactly the same kind of humbling feeling I try to instill in my colleagues. I say, I'm grateful to them for choosing a career in public service, and I'm grateful that they too can have that same feeling. And the vast majority of them believe that. I think that's a very keen insight that humility is a, a great complement to public service. So we're going to uh, turn things over to the uh, professor in charge. Hear a question from Dr. Ray Silvius. Thank you, and another welcome to Winnipeg, uh, Mayor Nancy. Uh, I'd like to ask you a very basic question, I think, but one that has uh, profound ramifications. Uh, Given um, the institution that you're in and the, the city uh, in which you now stand, I'd like to ask you what the notion of reconciliation means to you. Mm. Thank you. I touched on this um, in my remarks, but deliberately not wanting to stand too firmly on this ground in a context that is not my own, um, I was a bit shy about it. But about 18 months ago, I took the bus to Edmonton. And if you're ever wondering what the difference between the provincial and federal orders of government and the municipal government is, just remember the mayor took the bus to Edmonton. It's a very nice bus. And I carried with me a very awkward package. And I got off the bus and I walked through downtown Edmonton carrying this very awkward package. Um, and where I was going was to the final hearings of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, where I was going to be an honorary witness. And the awkward package was the City of Calgary's gesture of reconciliation, our first gesture of reconciliation. And it was a very simple one, that for the first time in Calgary history, instead of declaring a day of something or a week of something, which I often do, um, I declared a year. And it was the year of reconciliation. And since then, we have continued to talk about what reconciliation means to us as a community and also as a capital C city. We're developing a new Indigenous policy framework for the City of Calgary. Uh, my Chief of Staff, who's sitting in the front row, is spending much of his time developing new consultation protocols uh, with the nations near us. Um, certainly, our poverty reduction strategy has an enormous focus on Aboriginal uh, and Indigenous communities. I work a lot in urban Aboriginal issues. So these are the technical things. And you will see, I hope, if my council agrees, a very symbolic gesture of reconciliation uh, from the City of Calgary within the next six to eight months. Um, but to me, it's much deeper than that. And that concept of reconciliation really is about understanding that simple truth that I always talk about, that we're all in it together. Or to use perhaps um, more traditional language, that we share this land. And that's the hard part, because to develop a sense of shared prosperity and a common future, 
between indigenous, indigenous and non-indigenous people in our community is going to take a lot of getting over on both sides. A lot of getting over past injustices, as if you ever could. A lot of getting over biases. A lot of getting over mindsets in which we find ourselves. And I don't know how to do that. And I know that starting every speech with my bad Blackfoot is a tiny, tiny thing. But you know what? It matters to me. And I hope that it matters to the people who hear me. And setting the context of the place in which we live, the historical context for good and for bad, matters to me. And I hope that in these small gestures, as well as these bigger technical things that we do, that we are able to open up more people's hearts, more people's minds, and more people's arms to the concept of mutual prosperity. And once again, I will say that if we in Western Canada, of all places in the world, can't get this right, who can get this right? And this is an opportunity for us, once again, to be a beacon for the world. So we got to live and breathe that word reconciliation every day. And I think uh, some other big city mayors followed your lead on declaring years of reconciliation. Uh, I don't know if I was the first one, to be fair. But... Yeah. Well, this is currently the year of reconciliation in Winnipeg, so I don't know if you have bragging rights over Mayor Bowman when you guys meet uh, later on this week. No, i got to tell you one thing. Because, yeah. because I'm here in this city, I don't want to sound like I'm sucking up. <laughs> but on this file, your mayor is extraordinary. And he has been a leader for all of us uh, across this country on this. And I am uh, very, very proud to serve with him. He gets uh, some very good advice from uh, certain people. <laughs> so it says here that uh, I get to ask a question if there's time. So I don't know if we got time for one more. We got time? All right. So I couldn't uh, help but let my mind wander and you know think about another uh, politician with a non-Anglo name who became a professor without a doctorate uh, and wonder about what might be next for you. And, uh, you know, just to kind of set the parameters for that question, let's say that you couldn't be the mayor of Calgary, nor could you exit politics. What sort of... <laughs> what sort of politics might interest you the most? What an... What an interesting hypothetical, MLA. <laughs> Can you? <laughs> um, you know what? Uh, as I keep reminding my home university, I'm only on leave. Um, but I really, really do feel very, very lucky. And you know, yeah, people say mean stuff to you on the internet. And sometimes the people you work with try to gain points from being nasty to you. And sometimes the problems seem insolvable. But I really, really do think that I have the best political job in the country. First of all, I get to live in Calgary, which is awesome. But also, I get to work on stuff that really makes a difference to people's lives every day. Whether it is that great gift that a billion people in the world do not have, and that is the gift of clean, safe water. Or helping people get around and participate and join in their community, or dealing with poop. I spend an enormous amount of my time dealing with poop. And think about what would happen if we didn't deal with the poop. <laughs> I wasn't referring to the quality of political discourse in the provincial legislature. I mean, actually poop. So I love it. And so whenever anyone asks me, you know, are you interested in uh, provincial or federal politics, I always say two things. The first thing I say is, you know, I wear purple every day for a reason. It is neither red, blue, nor orange. Um, actually, it's a combination of red and blue. I just couldn't find a color that included orange as well. Um, kids always get that. You know, I say, why do you think I wear purple? And they say, because it's not red or blue. Um, but the other thing I always say is, why in the world would I want that demotion? The... <laughs> The good news is that we have brilliant, thoughtful people working 
on stuff they're passionate about in our provincial and federal governments in every party, um, all across this great country. And if I can have an impact on provincial or federal politics, I think that my impact greater than me being myself would be in inspiring those who are passionate about it to continue to do that. So thank you for doing what you do. He answered that with the uh, characteristic grace of a future provincial politician, I think. <laughs> All right. No, it's kidding. <laughs> All right, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Lowry back up to uh, make some closing remarks. And uh, thanks again for the chance to uh, dialogue with you on stage. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Okay, thank you uh, once again to Wab and to uh, Mayor Nenshi, and thank you to the students and faculty for those uh, wonderful and, and insightful questions. Uh, at this point, I'd like to invite back up to the stage uh, President and Vice Chancellor Dr. Nett Trimby to make some closing remarks. So this honor was going to be Dr. Axworthy's, but uh, I think he, his plane hasn't landed yet. So, Mayor Nenshi, you had us uh, when Sharon Paul said you sometimes pen poems. And those in the audience who know our provost will know why, because uh, we really like people who can write poems. As a former ecologist, one of the things I spent a lot of time thinking about was how t ecosystems achieved resiliency, and the key to ecosystem resiliency is no different than the key to community resiliency. It's all about diversity. So that message, message came through loud and clear. It's interesting to me that when big disasters happen, like fires or floods, everybody opens their heart and, to use your words, applies their humanity to deal with that cause. And yet, we know that there are a lot of chronic problems that we wish we could bring that same humanity to. So maybe it's about teaching people to see, to see what's right around them. Because the sad truth about Manitoba is we sometimes have floods where First Nations communities have been displaced, and sometimes those people wind up living in hotels for years and years. So we don't seem to have that same vision of the burning platform. Wouldn't it be great if each of us gave a gift to the nation for Canada's 150th and really thought about how we could help? You started this evening by expressing a little trepidation at being along with Cornell West and Jane Goodall. You said, and, and moi, you know, and you quoted Sesame Street. But what you have in common with the two of them if you, is you give us great hope. You're, you're, you're an optimist. And they also talked about, in slightly different ways, doing three things. Maybe Jane had four. No, she had three. And I understand from your chief of staff, who shared this little secret with me, that you still have the fire truck. You still have the <laughs> megaphone. So on that note, I, I want to thank you for sharing your voice without a megaphone, without a siren. It's been a great evening, and I also want to thank Paul. I want to thank Wab. It's great to have you back on campus. I want to thank Carlos. I want to thank class. I want to thank the students and all of you for attending this evening with us tonight. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Dr. Trimby. Just have a few final thank yous. I just want to uh, thank our media sponsor tonight, Metro. Uh, thank you to all, par oh, a special guest. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'd like to invite now to the podium, Dr. Lloyd Axworthy, whose vision 
an initiative during his tenure with the University of Winnipeg have made him the namesake of this series and to provide some closing, closing remarks. <laughs> I think this is what you call just-in-time delivery. <laughs> and I uh, apologize to Your Honor for uh, being late, but uh, one can never count on Air Canada's uh, precision when you're flying from Montreal here. And I, I had to be in Montreal for some meetings for the day, but uh, I, I just wanted to um, I'm glad I, I made it the last uh, 32 seconds so that we could. <laughs> um, and I know that uh, your presence here has been uh, highly honored. Um, you are one of the uh, leaders in this country who are sort of speaking out and giving voice to uh, the issue of uh, justice that. I think we, as Canadians, like to hold. Um, I was in Israel last week, and uh, during the course of some discussions with people at the Hebrew University, they introduced me to a biblical saying that you, you may know, or some of you, I see some religious studies people here who I'm sure would know it, but it's from Deuteronomy, where it says that uh, justice, justice you must pursue. And the meaning of that phrase is not just to be a rhetorical repetition of the word, but to say that there are a variety of ways that each of us pursues justice. And by pursuing it each in our own way, it adds to the common um, understanding and discussion about what it means. And I think that is certainly the prevalence that we need in this world. And uh, we are thankful and grateful for someone who pursues that notion of justice, Your Honor, that you have done so eloquently over the years and has brought to uh, the um, issue of our cities uh, a base for which we can now sort of look for leadership in uh, coming together with a much wider uh, global world. And in saying that, I, I won't take more of your time, you've, you've been here uh, long enough, but to um, also Thank the, uh, the sponsors. I've always been honored that this uh, lecture series has been sort of uh, been given the uh, somewhat dubious distinction of being in my name. But uh, um, as Carl has said, if it helps to sell a ticket or two, it's probably uh, worth it. Um, but I think it is very much again, and I see uh, with uh, Dr. Trimby here, that I think a function of a university is to open up this kind of venue and opportunity for discussion and conversation and reflection and sometimes uh, uh, serious difference. But uh, I discovered this weekend that I've moved from uh, being a member of the Liberal Party to being part of the Liberal Movement. I'm not sure exactly what that's going to entail uh, along the way, but I'm sure it will be different. Um, but I think it's also just part of the changes that, that are going on. And so uh, uh, thank you very much uh, to the um, committee that uh, puts together this uh, lecture series. It's been outstanding. I'm glad I've been able to join in it. I also see that one of our recently elected members of the Legislative Assembly, Wab Canoe, is with us uh, tonight. Uh, uh, Wab, I'm surprised you hadn't already sort of taken over the podium at this point in time. But <laughs> Congratulations. Um, and, and to the rest of you, I think this is a really a, a, a wonderful opportunity to uh, dedicate ourselves to that uh, basic lesson of Deuteronomy that justice, justice, we should pursue each in our own way. And so I want to thank uh, the mayor for his presence here and for his leadership and for the um, extension of that through the Committee of Faculty and uh, administration that puts together this uh, lecture series to remind us all 
exactly uh, how important it is. If I can just give a footnote to that comment, what struck me when I was in Israel just is how difficult it is for people in that region and that part of the world to fight for justice. It's something that is uh, ever-present and omnipresent. It, uh, it just reminded me how privileged much we have here, uh, that we have a sense of security, that we, uh, we can treat those issues uh, in a perhaps more calm, reflective, and sometimes in different way. In that part of the world, you can't. It's uh, with you every day, and I think that's part of what we have to learn, that we have to share those, those kinds of, um, of issues in a very real way. So thank you very much for the opportunity, and I, <laughs> uh, I'm just surprised that the uh, machinations of the Air Canada system uh, allow me to just be able to make this last sliver uh, of thought, <laughs> and I, I thank you, uh, thank you all for being here, and I hope uh, uh, that I can uh, sort of next time, and Dr. Trimby, I have promised next time I will be here uh, and not be in Montreal raising money for another cause. So, thank you all. Good night, and uh, congratulations. <laughs> Well, thank you to uh, Dr. Axworthy. That last-minute entrance is going to be hard to top as the lecture series goes forward. Um, I just want to thank all of our sponsors tonight. Uh, thank you to our media sponsor, uh, Metro. Thank you to all the donors for their support of the lecture series, including and especially Chancellor Silver, President Trimby, Dr. Axworthy, Albert El Tassi, Dr. Jim Burns, and the friends of the lecture series. Thank you as well to Dr. Carlos Colorado for championing this series. <laughs> to all the university staff, specifically the conference and events department and department of uh, marketing and communication for making this event a success. And finally, a huge thank you. Let's all extend a huge thank you to the volunteers uh, which made this lecture possible tonight. And thank you to all of you. Thank you to all of the faculty, students, those within the University of Winnipeg community, those without. Uh, and thank you for being part, as we said, of what we see as part of this lecture series, part of an ongoing discussion. And we hope that you'll join us uh, in the subsequent lectures in this vital and necessary discussion about social justice and the need for the public good. Thank you very much, and good night. <laughs>